Mr. Anderson? Here. Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Mrs. Gasparro? Here. Dr. Hall? Here. Mrs. Sanders? Mr. Ture? Here. And Mrs. Galbraith is here. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening. Thank you. This time we'll have our good news report, board acknowledgements. Good news report for tonight is from Talala Elementary Touchdowns and Crete Elementary Monthly Spotlight. Before we start that, we want to acknowledge if we have any special guests or elected officials in the audience. Okay, are we ready? So Talala, oh, I see you. Ms. Johnson, sorry. Thank you. Good evening. Ms. Johnson, before we get started, would you like the board to go down to be able to see yes, your presentation? Nice. Okay, you. we'll head down to the audience. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'm Michelle Johnson, principal of Talala Elementary, and I am so excited to share with you um, some of our highlights for this school year. Um, I have joining here for full support with me is Mr. Derek Watson. He is our administrative dean. So this year we started off, of course, with our wonderful minion um, to kick off our math mastery facts. Um, we had a wonderful volunteer, our permanent guest sub, who um, helped us out in, in uh, surprising the students with the Minion costume and to jumpstart our math facts. We also started off the school year with our student council sponsored um, Harvest Dance. Uh, we had well over 250 students to participate as well as parents. Um, this is a great fundraiser for our student council in support of our at, of our activities at Talala. We also had a wonderful Mix It Up day. We decided to extend it beyond Mix It Up at lunch. Um, we had our ambassadors uh, this year, which really gave a wonderful helping hand to the school. Um, they were comprised of, of, of our safety patrol as well as students from our student council. We also had our PBIS coach and student council facilitators to assist Mr. Watson and I. We started off the day with fun activities in the classroom in which the teachers exchanged classrooms. So, so for example, we had some of our fifth grade teachers go into kindergarten classrooms. <laughs> that was interesting. And our kindergarten teachers to flip-flop and go to the older grades. Um, and it gave them a wonderful eye-opening experience on um, how to, to handle children at various levels. We also had a mix it up activity in uh, the cafeteria in which students had to assist each other with activities that they were unfamiliar with. Um, so it gave them the opportunity to challenge themselves as well as to create team building uh, unison. We also had a lunch date in which children were encouraged to sit with other students um, that they typically do not. And then we also mixed up the lunch mods. 
Towards the end of the day, the effort was there. Uh, we attempted, it was very windy, and for those of you who are familiar with the paper lanterns, you have to have optimal weather in order for those to work. Um, but the effort was there. Uh, we had the entire school outside um, to um, make the attempt of, of uh, lighting those lanterns, so we put those away, and the goal is to do that for field day. Our night of leadership, we were really excited. Again, that was um, led by our student council representatives. We also participated in the model and um, essentially the model that was elected or selected by our school uh, became the student council model, which is today we are learners. Today we are learners, tomorrow we are leaders. Our student council also featured their service project for the showcase board at central office. Uh, they had a wonderful service project that featured um, a competition with, among students in the various grade levels to bring in um, home consumables or um, household items, things that, things that um, those who are unfortunately will need that we typically take for granted, such as toothpaste, mouthwash. So those items were collected and distributed to a, um, a local um, facility that is a shelter for women and um, the classrooms that raised the most, um, that brought in the most items, we gave them a pizza party. We also, again, um, have fundraisers with our student council. Um, they have monthly meetings. We encourage them to uh, make sure that they um, have good citizenship and are model students throughout the school year. Our school-wide winter musical was a huge success. Almost every seat in the auditorium was filled to capacity. Um, Mr. Moody is a first-year teacher here um, at Crete Moni. He did an excellent job. Um, the students uh, performed exceptionally well. He worked uh, tirelessly with the students for this musical. Uh, parents, grandparents, um, again, supported their children in, in high numbers. It was a fantastic um, event. The good thing about starting off the school year with um, having music, um, which is what uh, Moni and I did, is that we ended it with a wonderful winter musical um, right here on this stage. As you can see, again, the audience um, was fully supported, um, our students, and they did exceptionally well to have an all, I was a little nervous um, to have an all school-wide uh, musical, but um, they did. They put their best efforts forward. We also had a, um, a, a door decorating contest, and we had several winners. It was very difficult to um, make those choices in terms of who would um, win with that, but we had several classes that gave it their, I mean, gave it their all. Um, a fourth grade class uh, that did paper cutouts, a kindergarten class that focused selfies. Of course, you know, that's a huge thing. And, and um, one of the kindergarten teachers, Ms. Show Watcher, mentioned she said she didn't even have to give instructions on how to um, <laughs> on how to operate a, a camera or even to focus for a selfie. And then um, our new teacher, uh, Ms. Maddox, did a, an oversized gingerbread house on the outside of her door. And again, all classes worked extremely hard, and our teachers um, gave a lot of extra time. Um, one new um, focus that I wanted to make sure we fully implement, we did a soft implementation the last two years with a parent teacher club. This year we went full throttle with making sure that we have a strong PTO return to Talala. Um, Mr. Watson and I worked hard, tirelessly with parents in promoting our PTO this year. So we have um, our president, Danielle Perez, Secretary Valerie Boutron, and our treasurer, Imani Hicks. And with our PTO, we had a wonderful Krispy Kreme fundraiser. Um, we made over $1,900, actually $1,932 to be exact in donuts. 
Um, I made the attempt. The effort was there again. Mr. Watson and I wanted to provide Krispy Kreme donuts to you, but you are probably already aware that there's only one location open in Homewood. And I called and the, the manager said the line was wrapped around the building. So I have a coupon and I'll make sure that you, we will have those delivered to you at your next board meeting. Hopefully with the hot sign flashing. You have to have them with the hot sign. Um, but it, it, this is a great fundraiser. I encourage all schools um, or any other organizations to look into it. Um, the Krispy Kreme truck delivery truck came directly to our school. Um, we had boxes and boxes of donuts uh, set up um, and our PTO helped to do that as well as our office staff. Um, we had four place winners. Our first place winner, Alayla Spears, she will receive one dozen donuts for the entire year. Tyler Adams, our second place winner, will receive a, um, a dozen for six months. Uh, Jada Habrowski, third place, a dozen for thir three months. And Zaniah McCants, a dozen for three months. And we have some additional perks that we provided as well. So again, this was a wonderful kickoff for our PTO um, as their first fundraiser for this school year. Some of our PBIS events, we're very fortunate to have a continual donation from our Park Forest Police Department. They donate bikes. Um, this is a long-running community effort or partnership um, to our, for our school. So every month um, we have a raffle um, at our PBIS um, assembly and, and students, um, whether it's a boy or girl, uh, will have the opportunity to receive a bike from the drawing. We also have Celebration Station in which we celebrate students who reach their goals from a classroom perspective um, to make sure that we continue as a PBIS team and a school to highlight positive behaviors. Oftentimes, I know um, as an administrator and an educator, sometimes we, we want to focus on the ones who... Um, as I call them, our Talala lovelies, who sometimes give us a bit of challenge, but we have to remember that we um, have a high percentage of students who have zero to one referrals that we'll make sure that we focus on at the end of the school year, but as well as those who are uh, making good choices on an ongoing basis and, and acknowledging those students. So the celebration station are different activities um, in which the students have the ability to participate in school-wide. And again, that is an earned activity. Recently, I had lunch with three students who used their Talala tickets to make a purchase to have lunch with the principal. It was a very expensive lunch. Um, it cost 300 tickets to do that. So I was actually very honored um, to um, have them have lunch with me. This year, um, we have returning Girls on the Run which um, many years ago I served as a on, on the board of Girl, Girls on the Run in Chicago. I'm an avid runner. Um, I highly um, encourage um, students, whatever, whatever their fitness level might be, just to move. So we have um, several staff members who are volunteering their time and working with a wonderful group of young girls, third through fifth grade, um, and, and instilling those um, healthy choice behaviors, as well as encouraging a consistent fitness lifestyle. They meet twice out of the week. They um, use um, the, the materials that are provided, as well as encourage positive behavior. So there is a, a character ed built in, in addition to the fitness piece. So we're excited with our um, to make sure that um, we participate in the first 5K run this school year. Other school events and partnerships, we have a continual partnership with um, the Grassroots Foundation in Park Forest, where we have an artist that will um, come to our school once a week for five weeks and um, work directly with our students for a small fee. Um, she does a lot of abstract art. Um, it's a great way to extend our art program that we're happy to have back this school year. And it has been a wonderful partnership. Our business liaison, uh, Sandra Quarles, a third grade teacher, has worked um, hand in hand with uh, Tall Grassroots and making sure that this is a continual program at our school.
We also feature, um, in addition to a number of incentives, but we wanted to highlight our students of the month um, in which they are selected by their classroom teacher, not just based on their academics, but of course those students who've had significant growth in their behavior as well as improvements as relates to their instruction. They have pizza. Um, with Mr. Watson and I, and the funniest thing is they're the group of kids where we um, have to make them talk because I guess because they're student of the month, they don't say very much um, in class. So it's, you know, we always try to encourage conversation um, and, and make sure that they understand that this is a fun activity. They can talk while eating pizza. So um, we have this, we honor those students once a month. Uh, earlier in the school year, we had our PBIS family night. We also had our uh, literacy component in which we had two uh, representatives from Park Forest and the University um, from University Park Library to come out and share with parents on encouraging them to read beyond with their children uh, and have their children read with them beyond the school day, as well as extending writing activities work and workshops that were done and ran by our reading team. Upcoming, we have our PTO Family Fun Dance um, that will be in April. We also have an additional um, May Literacy Night, we have two literacy nights of the school year, so we have a, an additional one that's forthcoming. Um, we are partnering with a, a mentor that worked with our fourth grade classes, so those fourth grade students are now in fifth grade, and he will be meeting with them starting in April uh, to encourage them as they are making uh, the leap towards sixth grade. So he will spend um, approximately 30 minutes once a week um, for um, eight weeks going into the end of the school year. Grandparents Day is a huge, I encourage all those to come out and take a visit, um, participate. Um, it's one of the ones that I cherish the most um, as I think about the relationships I've had with my grandparents and, and the impact that they had on my life. And so grandparents say we have well over 300 visitors at Talala. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a wonderful opportunity to showcase and highlight um, our school and, and our students. And it's just not grandparents day um, because we know that in some instances, um, grandparents aren't, aren't there in some families. So it's special friends day as well. And they visit the classrooms, they, do, they have a special activity that they work with with the children as well as have lunch. So it's a wonderful day. Um, our teachers work extremely hard, not just with this activity, but with all the events and um, activities that we have with the students. Um, so this is a great day, this is in May. Um, last but not least, coming, forthcoming, and I'm sure there are other things, um, but the one that we want to highlight um, is the school-wide field trip to the movies. Last year, the entire school, and I mean the entire school, there were only a handful of students who were left behind, and that was by choice. Um, they said that they already saw the movie and they wanted to stay at school. So maybe five students only remained back at Talala. The entire school went to the movies in Orland Park. And we um, had, I think it was two theaters um, and saw Jungle Book. And it was an extremely well-organized um, ac activity. Um, it proved that children beyond the classroom um, have their best expectations when it's given to them, and those expectations were set. Um, we had a wonderful support system with our teachers and chaperones. The other upcoming activity um, is field day. That's huge at Talala as well, so I'm so happy that we have our PTO to help defray the cost. It's a it's an expensive day, but the school is wide open for children. Um, all children will participate as they do with the field trip. Teachers also have um, their incentive-based field trips for their classrooms um, where they are encouraged to have an educational field trip as well as a fun activity as, um, as well. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time.
Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm a little taller than Ms. Johnson, so I do need to adjust this. Hopefully that'll be good for both of us. I am Erin Lane, and I am the principal of Crete Elementary, and we are very excited to be with you this evening. I also have my dean, Mrs. Roberts, who is here with me this evening as well. And we are also going to do something similar to what Ms. Johnson did this evening. We're going to spotlight some of our memorable events and activities that we've had during the course of the school year at Crete Elementary. Starting with our summer reading and math packet uh, celebration, at the end of last school year, our students were given a summer reading and math packet that to complete over the summer. We gave our students to mid-September to hand in those packets for an opportunity to participate in an ice cream celebration. We had 36 students turn in the packet, and they, also, they were able to participate in the ice cream celebration. The ice cream was uh, provided by our PTO. Okay, in October, we had on a Friday, right before our Mix It Up at Lunch event, this is something that we do every year, well, for about the past three years. We kick it off with our PTO Decade Dance, and we celebrate the music of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Students are able to have a blast from the past dress-up evening. They're also offered the opportunity to wear those outfits during the school day to celebrate their favorite decade of music. So this is always very fun and the principal really likes it. Of course, I didn't I did not include any pictures of myself though in this slideshow, but there are quite a few. Um, I did do a 60s costume this year. I've done an 80s in the past. We celebrate, we do a lot of great music, have a great DJ. It's very well attended and supported by our families. Um, I think the highlight of the evening is I have a group of teachers that always do the party train, and we kind of do the little party train around the school and come back in the gym, and the kids get a big kick out of it. And it's a great start for our Mix It Up event. We also celebrate the Mix It Up at lunch day, as the, the schools do throughout the district. Um, this past year, we celebrated on October 25th. And once again, um, very similarly to Talala in our elementary schools within the district, we did have a minion theme. So we just basically piggybacked off of that for our Mix It Up Day theme. And we had a minion ways to be a good friend. So in advance of our event, our students wrote about ways that they would be a good friend. We also decorated our cafeteria with their writing. Blue and gold was our color scheme. It goes along with the minion. It also goes along with our school and our district colors. And here are a few more pictures of our minion and our students during their lunchtime events. And on, on the actual Mix It Up at Lunch Day, students participated in activities both in their classrooms and with partner classroom, different age levels. We had music at lunchtime that had a friendship and a minion theme, so there was a lot of dancing. I think uh, Ms. Hirsch, she's over there, she stopped by and was able to enjoy some of that time with us as well. And we are very excited to be recognized as a 2017 Mix It Up Model School. So we're very excited for that recognition. Thank you. In November, we participate in the district-wide effort uh, to educate our student on the, students on the voting process. Our student council members brainstormed uh, three models that our, student, our school could use to vote on to present during a uh, night of leadership. Uh, the first model was education is the reason for the school season. The second model was buildings with four blue walls and gold and a gold tomorrow inside. And the third model, was making each statement better because all students matter. We turned our parent room into a polling place and students were invited down by class to come and participate in the voting process. They chose making each student better because all students matter. Our student council members presented this model at night of leadership and although we didn't win, they did enjoy participating in the process.
they enjoyed it, but they really were quite disappointed, let me say. We should have probably done a lesson on uh, sportsmanship because I think they thought they were going to win. So that was an interesting conversation that we had afterwards. All right. In November, we had our Reading is Fun Literacy Night. Our theme is Reading is Fun. What's missing? You are. So we try to couple our literature selections with some fun activities. So we started our evening off, as we always do, with some type of meal. So we had pizza and we had dessert in our cafeteria. And then the students and the parents were able to split up. So we did a parent workshop for all of our parents and adults that were there that evening on how to support their learners at home, different strategies they can use with their, with their learners of all different ages to support them. We also had um, a special event for our students. They were able to hear a selection called The Book With No Pictures. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent book. If you've not seen it before, it's definitely worth a quick read. There are no pictures, but it's very, um, very silly, very rhythmic, very interesting for students. They, they get a huge kick out of it. So I would highly recommend pulling up the YouTube by, I believe it is BJ Novak is the author. Then in conjunction with the book, the students made a uh, Mystery Matter project. Mystery Matter is kind of like slime or oobleck. Those are some other things that it's sometimes called. It's an activity that teachers often do in their classrooms as part of science because it has solid and liquid qualities. So it was very messy, but very fun, and it had a nice little connection to the book as well. Afterwards, the parents joined us, so they came in at the end of the, the Mystery Matter section, and they listened to a book called The Night in the Country by Cynthia Ryland, and it's a very um, beautifully il illustrated book about basically a night in the country, the sights and the sounds that you'd experience. And then our students were able to create with their parents. Um, this was a mason jar light that had, um, it had lights in it and pine cones. It was very festive because we did this um, shortly before the winter break. So it was, it was just a nice event. Our students had the opportunity to earn positive praise tickets for demonstrating characteristics of our focus words, learning, acceptance, respect, and safety. Our students can enter these tickets into our monthly draw drawing, or they also have the option of saving 20 tickets and participating in what we call save options. In December, we offer three save options, extra PE with Mr. Hullinger, donuts with the dean, and pastries with the principal. And needless to say, they love these options, and we know that they like donuts with the dean the best. No, 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 we're going to fight. No, pastry, <laughs> pastries with the principal the night that I, I spent staying up late baking cookies because we're, we were going to do the cookie decorating. Basically, that's what it was the next day. And then we had a snow day the next day. So I was like, okay, but it worked out. We, we had it the very next day when we came back to school. In December, we also have, you want to continue sure. with cookies and hot chocolate? In December, we also have Cookies and Hot Chocolate, sponsored by Holland Company. They are a business partner of ours and have been for probably the last seven years. They've sponsored this event for the last three years. And what they do is they dress up as Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus, and they come and walk around, and each kid gets an opportunity to sit with Santa Claus and give him her, his Christmas list, his or her Christmas list. And they are able to enjoy Dunkin' Donuts, hot chocolate, and cookies. All right, in January, our PTO sponsored a zero to one ice cream referral party. Um, we have a very generous PTO and they work constantly in support of our students. And they wanted to celebrate our students who had one or less referrals. So there, hence, therefore, the zero to one ice cream referral party. And we were very fortunate in that we had about 96% of our students that were able to take part in this celebration. And again, once again, very grateful for our very active and very supportive PTO. 
We had a great turnout for our math and science month uh, night last month. Uh, after enjoying a meal together in the cafeteria, our families were able to go and participate in two of the four sessions that we were offering. Uh, the family favorites seemed to be our um, egg drop session, um, where the families were given an egg and materials and told to uh, package the egg in such a way that if they dropped it several feet, that it would not break. And needless to say, it got a little messy, but uh, a good time was had by all. And if you ever give it, are given an opportunity to participate in an egg drop, this was ingenious, not exactly what I would have thought of doing, but it seemed like the students that had created the parachute basically that surrounded the egg and the container were the winners. Theirs did the best, so that was pretty interesting. All right, in March, we, um, for our fifth graders, we have a fifth grade Black History Month Wax Museum, and we celebrate that on our student-led parent-teacher conference night. So our students in fifth grade, basically they research a person, and then they're able to dress up in costume, like the person they've selected. They create a poster board, display board with information, a timeline, and different photos that pertain to that individual. And then they're able to do an oral report regarding that particular individual. So they're set up in the gym, and you go around, and if you want to hear their report, you have to place a coin or any type of money, they only do this for money, in their container. The money that they collect is used for their end of the year dance. So it's always a great event. I was extremely impressed this year. Um, one of our fifth grade teachers, unfortunately, was quite ill at the time that this event occurred. She wasn't able to be there that night. And my other fifth grade teacher is brand new to the grade level, brand new to the building. And the kids were awesome. They looked great. They sounded great. The, the behavior was very mature. So I couldn't be more proud. And they were able to make $200 that night for their dance. So we're very excited about that. Sponsored by the Illinois State Library, our fourth and fifth grade classrooms were given um, an opportunity to have 20 different book titles in their room from a Blue Stem Reader's Choice Award list. Um, in addition to that, they were also given two of those titles to keep for themselves. The students who read all 20 titles and the class that had the most votes for their favorite book with uh, having the limitation, well, having the requirement they read at least four books in the class, participated in an ice cream celebration earlier this month. All right, and then starting this month, and we're looking very forward to our Crete Cougar Choir, which we just established basically a few weeks ago with our music teacher, Mr. Moody. We have approximately 65 students, third through fifth grade students, that are now meeting once per week with him for choir. They will be meeting twice a week with him after we finish park testing. So they are on their third meeting this week. Um, they're rehearsing several songs. We plan on having them perform at our grandparents and special persons day and also our end of the year recognition assemblies. Um, something that was very cool that Mr. Moody has done with them is we've had our Crete Cougar song for years. I know Ms. Hirsch is also familiar with our Crete Cougar song. Um, he rewrote it as a rap. So they're going to be performing it for, like I said, Grandparents Day, Special Persons Day, and end of the year recognition. So those are a few of the many great activities and events we have at Crete Elementary. Thank you so much for, for listening and giving us this opportunity this evening.
Thank you to our wonderful principals, Ms. Lane and Mrs. Johnson. Thank you for taking the time out to come and share with us the very awesome things that are going on in your buildings. That's what I love about this portion of the board meeting. It's about great things. We call it the good news, but same thing um, of the things that are going on in our buildings, and that's why we're all here. So thank you all. I'd like to allow the board members to say anything if they would like. Start with Ms. Gasparro. First, I'll start with Mrs. Johnson. Um, I cannot tell you how glad I am that you have a PTO back at Talala. And I know that it is not easy to set that up. Um, having been through it myself, Dr. Hall and I were um, founding board members of the ELC PTO. And I know that you and I discussed the different possibilities for that. So I am very glad that you have that back. And I wish you much success with that. So thank you for doing that. And um, with Crete, Miss Lane, the I saw in one of the pictures you actually created the ballot booths. Did all the students do that, or were they just? I, that was that. I never would have thought about that. That was the, that was good. That gives them the whole perspective. Fabulous, wonderful idea. Thank you. Congratulations. What did you guys make those? Was it boxes? Oh, okay. Nice. I do want to thank you as well, uh, Principals uh, Lane and Johnson, on a magnificent job that all of the, the principals do in the, in the district uh, engaging, and this includes your staff and teachers as well. Uh, engaging our students in such a way it just does something dear to my heart. Now, now the Krispy Kremes and the ice cream and all the sweets. So I hope you have a neutralizer for those components, okay? So keep doing the good work, appreciate it. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, thanks for the, for, for, for the report. You know, uh, a lot of times on social media, you get to, you know, there's a lot of negative talk about the schools, but it's always a great reminder to me to remember that every day there's thousands of students having really, really meaningful experiences and, and some amazing educators at work in our schools and that every day there's just an infinite number of potentially transformative moments for these kids. So, and the dedication and the passion for your work always comes through in these presentations too, so thank you. Thank you all. You, you guys are the, the foundation to future young adults that are going to be successful in life. Uh, you can't build a house without the foundation, and you guys at the elementary level are the foundation. So please keep up the good work and make a strong and sturdy foundation for these young men and women to become successes in their future. Thank you very much. There's never anything left to say when you're the last one, but thank you very much for everything you do. Um, I love coming there and spending time with you, and I hope that you're both not having grandparents slash special friend day on the same day. It's really hard for me to do both of them, and you know how much I love it. Are they both on the same day? What? Okay, well, we'll just do morning and afternoon, just like kindergarten. Um, Half day, yeah, we'll get half day, but thank you very much. And Creed Elementary on that day, will you be having ice cream? <laughs> oh, so you must get morning, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. You guys are doing marvelous things every day with our young people. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Dr. Cunningham. 
it's wonderful for you guys to come here and share what you have in your schools every day. The work that you guys are doing, it's, it's not always known, so it's nice to get it out in front of the public. I get an opportunity to come by, drop by, and see you guys, whether you guys are um, in there playing hockey with the kids or you're doing some of the special pull-out reading things that I see. Uh, the hard work that you're doing is making an impact, and we just really appreciate that. The extra stuff that we're doing, working with our PTOs, getting a new PTO, making sure that we are creating that foundation, working with our parents and our community is something else that just strengthens our schools. So I so appreciate that, and it's wonderful to see it here. Thank you. And I want to say uh, to Ms. Miller and Mr. Watson, I know this is your first year, so welcome aboard and thank you for all that you do at those schools as well. Okay, at this time we will move on to our public comment section of our board meeting. We have two this evening. First one, Mr. James Young and Tracy Worth from University Park Public Library District regarding the services, activities, and programs at the University Park Public Library. Good evening, Doctor. It says, testing, testing, okay. Got to speak a little bit closer. Uh, good evening, Dr. Hall, um, members of the board, uh, Dr. Cunningham, administrative staff, and to our listening audience. Um, we're, we're a duo tonight, okay? I'm no stranger to Creek Money uh, School District 201 because I'm the proud parent of three graduates. And I'm always impressed about the good work that our schools are doing. So congratulations from the public. Tonight I'm here to represent the Board of Trustees of the University Park Library. And with me is our director, Tracy Worth. We want you to know that uh, we remain a very viable, dedicated, and committed institution and facility for promoting education. So with that being said, I'm going to let Tracy share with you some of the programs, activities, and services that we offer at the library. Each board member and administrative staff should have received one of our newsletters. And we'll leave some more at the table for any member of the audience that wants it. Thank you and good evening. Dr. Hall, members of the board, um, I do have to apologize upright. The board meeting for the library is the same night as the school board meeting, so I've never had the opportunity. But tonight, I made special plans to get over here and talk to you guys, because we have a lot of things going on at the library this month. Um, but we last year, we started an event called Rec Saturdays. And so Rec Saturdays is simply two hours of tutoring or homework help. And then the afternoon, the kids can come and play um, video games, they can get on the computers, they can do a craft, they can do a self-guided craft, um, but it's just to give them a place to go in the middle of the school year, and we did this from January all the way to December, and we started up again, and they do come, and so now we've been offering, um, if they finish their homework, after the homework pe help period is over, we allow them to go and game, and we get the kids in and so our effort has been to just get the kids in on a uh, consistent basis not just for special programs that being said um, rec Saturdays every Saturday all ages we offer something for everybody and if we don't have something they want to make a suggestion we'll take that too um, we offer March 25th we're gonna have the scholarship mom she will be there to talk about how to have a uh, debt-free education if that's possible and I'm praying that it is because I have three on the way headed to college I got some time to save but anyway um, we offer shred day if you don't know about shred day it is free you have two hours to come to the library it's starting at 11 o'clock on April 8th and all we ask is that you have it in a box. If you have a business, we can't help you, but if it's for your personal, if you've ever used a shred truck, it's a very um, private thing. They shred it and then we don't see anything. We don't collect it. You just show up in the parking lot, you give them your boxes, they put it in the machine and it's done. Um, our most favorite program, okay, all of our programs are good, but next Wednesday night, we have our fifth annual Cotton Club in the Box. And Cotton Club in the Box is a night of music to kick off Jazz History Month, with this, which is April. Um, Wednesday night is the only night that we can really do 
Cotton Club in the Box because our musicians are professional musicians who play with the likes of Ramsey Lewis and others. And that's the cheap night. I can get them on a Wednesday night. I cannot get them on a Friday or Saturday, so it's never going to happen. So if you want to see them, you got to come out next week. But if you've never seen a live tap dancer, you got to come and see our live tap dancer. His name is Brill Barrett. He is world renowned. Um, for his tap dancing abilities. He has a school in the city, but he is phenomenal. And it's a night of fun. We offer a dessert bar. It is all free. And this year we are collecting food for the Moni Township. Um, yes. Um, oh, I lost my words. But anyway, we're collecting food. There we go, food bank. Um, so it's free. So bring a non-perishable item and come out and join us for the dessert bar. And we have giveaways. It's free, fun. Um, oh, and. It is at the library. We turn it into a nightclub, but it's all, no fighting, no drinking, no cussing, none of that. It's all clean, as much as you can be singing jazz. Pardon me. Oh, we do, we do. We um, we have figured out a way to clear out the space. And if you've not been to the library lately, I invite you to stop by and see us. We have laptops, we have computers, we have books. We are just trying to find ways to make sure the thing about University Park Public Library is that we have to offer everything that every other library, big or small, offers throughout this state. And thus far, we are solvent and we are able to do that. So while you may not be able to get every book, because you have a library card, you can have access to every book in the system. So if you need something, just tell us, hey, I need this. Educators, we ask you to uh, let us know when you have assignments and you need special items, and we will do our best to get them for you. So the rest of our gatherings for the month all the way until May is in our newsletter, so I invite you to get a copy at the back. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. It's always great to hear the wonderful things going on in our libraries. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I, I, you know, personally, James uh, Young, before you leave, and I never had a chance to meet Tracy, but I want to thank you for allowing your staff to assist Moni Township in a youth program for tutoring. We was doing it in-house, and James been a certified teacher. He thought it was best. We was using students, of high achieving students to teach those that needed help, the younger students. But James came in and he utilized your staff and as well as certified teachers. And I did not get a chance to go to the celebration at the end of the year. So thank you since you came here. I'm personally, thank you. Thank you so much and James. All right, thank you. Now I believe it now. You always told me that. I believe it now. All right, thank you. Thanks to the United States Army too, James. <laughs> they let you go. Yeah, I just want to mention we did have a couple of teachers that yeah that helped with that program over the summertime. So thanks to those teachers too. Next we have Ebony Rucker. Bullying and harassment. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I want to first thank you all for your time and for your service. I know you volunteer countless of hours. Uh, I know you volunteer countless of hours uh, for kids who once sat in these same seats as myself. Um, and so tonight I come to you um, really begging and pleading for your help. Um, bullying and harassment is something that is very strong. Social media, um, with phones, with cameras, with everything that we have going on in the world, um, it's becoming taunting, okay? It's becoming very taunting. Um, so um, I'm here because of a situation very near and dear to my heart and to me personally. And I have some documents that I would like to share with the school board members. If you would just imagine for one second, it was your kid that you received this information for, or if this was your kid, um, if this was Aiden, or if this was Kenna, or um, Isabella, or um, one of your children, how would you feel if this was the information that your, uh, a child in your family was dealing with? 
Um, my family raises us to be great individuals, okay? To give back to the community, to work very hard, to be very diligent, um, to be productive citizens in society, okay? Um, so when situations happen, whether they be at school, whether they be in the community, we have been taught to speak up. If something is wrong, if you see something that is wrong or that is unfair, or if you see a, a physical altercation and you can do anything about it, then you do that. However, to be ridiculed because of systems that are lacked um, is unfair to children, not just to someone that's dear to me, but unfair to children as a whole. Um, there was a situation that took place in this building and that individual that you have there today was brought out of school because of being bullied and harassed. My family took proper avenues. We contacted people, we sent emails. We were able to speak with Dr. Clark's secretary today and was told that things will be handled at the high school level. How only the only person to return an email without someone coming here to pick this individual up was Ms. Trish, who's not even in the building. Um, so it's very nervous, it's very nerve wracking for me. Um, it's very nerve wracking, not just for this individual who did the right thing. If this was something that he was wrong for or that he shouldn't have done, that would be a totally different outcome and a totally different look. But this kid did what no other kid would do, and that is quote unquote snitch on what he saw and what he felt was wrong. So at this point, I'm asking, not right now, I don't expect to get any solutions right now. Um, I just received an email upon me walking in here today from an administrator um, that I left several messages for all today, um, even yesterday evening. So I'm just asking that we're very mindful on how we collect information from students, on how we gather things. I know SB 100 makes it very difficult and very tricky. I work in the education field myself. I see it, I deal with it on so many levels. Um, however, it's not fair for kids to come forth to do the right thing that nobody else wants to do and for them to be bullied, harassed, and ridiculed because of it, especially when the picture you have in front of you was taken inside of your dean's office. Um, and so I ask that something um, be done about this. This picture has been shared 153 times on Facebook, and it has been retweeted on Twitter over 227 times, the last message that I got. Um, this kid didn't even wanna stay at school today. School is some place that you should feel that if nowhere else, that you are safe. Um, and so I just wanted to give you that information because I feel like you are a board of integrity um, and trust. And like I said, if it was your child, which you're serving the district for other children, for all children, and me being an advocate for all children myself, um, if that was your child and that was them in this situation, you as parents, um, how would you feel? And not just for this situation, but for all kids, for all kids, this is wrong. Um, this kid feels humiliated. He feels like his life, his high school career as, a, as an athlete is done because he's been ridiculed 24 seven all day to where he couldn't even stay at school today. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to my comments. Um, I hope that we can come, that you guys can come to um, some sort of agreement as a whole on how to remedy or rectify this situation. Um, and just uh, as a, um, maybe because I always feel if you have a complaint, you should give some sort of suggestion that in these spaces, in these confidential spaces, whether it be dean's offices or whatever, I know phones are very tricky, but in those situations when kids are giving you confidential information, people shouldn't be allowed, kids shouldn't be allowed to have phones in those type of spaces where they're able to access their cameras and take pictures and things are put on social media that are belittling and demeaning to our children. That takes a mental toll on children. Kids commit suicide every day because of things like this. I don't wanna be here. I don't know how my heart stopped when, that, when I received that, because is that you don't wanna be here in school or is that you don't wanna be here in this world? And that's serious, it's very serious. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Rucker. I know we normally don't comment on public comment, that's our procedure. And this is a sensitive situation when you're dealing with a particular student. 
but I want to say that this is real. This is what our kids go through. There is a code of not snitching. And I feel like a lot of times we find out things because our kids tell us these things. And if we cannot, and I'm not saying we're not, I'm just saying, if we cannot create an environment where our, our kids feel comfortable sharing information, because our kids wanna do the right thing. We tell them all the time, if you know something, say something. But they should feel like they're safe to say something. And like I said, I'm not saying we're not doing that. What I'm saying is we need to ensure that we're creating that environment for them. Whatever we're doing, we need to tighten it up. Whatever needs to take place needs to take place. And if we do not make it where our kids feel comfortable telling the truth, we wouldn't know half the things that are going on in our school or more than that. And bullying is serious. It's a serious offense. It is something that the state of Illinois does not take lightly. We have to, by law, have an anti-bullying program in place in our schools. And we just need to do whatever we need to do in order to make sure that we are addressing this issue, any bullying issue, not take it lightly. I've shared with the superintendent, I think we need to define bullying. I think we need to define it with our children, with our staff. And you know, some kids can think something is bullying and it's not. Or some kids can think that it's not bullying and, and it is, and they can take it. And we don't know until it's too late. So we need to take this seriously and do whatever we need to do to, to investigate. I, I can say to you, Ms. Rucker, I believe the administration um, at the high school takes these things seriously. But what I'm saying is to the superintendent, this breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart just because our kids are so vulnerable. They're, like I said, they wanna do the right thing. But if they're feeling like if I do the wrong, right thing, I'm gonna be shamed or a picture is gonna be taken of me while I'm sharing information and sent out, they're gonna stop doing the right thing. I would, I would like to say something to you too, Miss, uh, Miss Rucker, over here. I would hope that the school board takes a very hard look on the uh, social media problem and eliminating these cell phones during classroom hours. I've talked about it for two years and it's not happened. Uh, I think personally think these phones should stay in the locker from the time they come in school to the last bell of the day. And uh, there's phones in every classroom. They could be reached if necessary. Um, I just think it adds to the problem and this kind of amplifies it again. I mean, you know, there, there's this social media stuff is way out of hand and, and it's hurtful to these children. And, and I'd like to give them six hours a day where they don't have to deal with this, but that's my personal feeling. And I encourage the board to take another look at it. Thank you. Every child deserves to be safe and we need to provide that for them. Um, 
I, I, I can just, I just want to just, just want to make sure of uh, this record records just before you leave I just want to make sure that somebody got this We're gonna grab this we got action on this that do Understood. So again, uh, Superintendent, so we're going to put it on you, Mr. Too. Brown, if I may. Go ahead, Dr. Clark. Uh, Dr. Harden was notified, and I know he's been in contact with the parent, and he has spoken with her to put some things in place. So he did email me when I received this um, from uh, Ms. Rucker. I emailed him right away, and he's already um, spoken with the parent. So, so we are know. we are taking action on this. Yes, sir. Um, according to our procedures and yes, guidelines sir. and not taking any steps back. We're moving forward, full press. Yes, uh, sir. Okay. We're going to um, touch bases again in the morning so he can tell me the outline of everything. Appreciate it. Um, Dr. Harden would like to talk real quick. Not correct, but add a point of clarity yeah, just sorry. really quickly, if I may. Uh, the uh, deans have been in touch. We have uh, confidentiality things that we have to be very careful of to where we speak with the custodial parent. And uh, we know this is a super sensitive situation and not taking it lightly at all. Very super sensitive situation, but we still have to mind all confidentiality, uh, everything confidentiality. Uh, the deans have been in contact from what they reported to me. I too will be in contact with the parent of the student involved. I sent Ms. Rucker an email. I'm sorry I didn't even notice that you were in here until after you had gotten up and walked to the front. I sent you an email when I was on my way in from my office to say, hey, I saw your message this afternoon. I saw your emails this morning. I wanted to go through all the channels to make sure that we got all the facts straight. And I said I would certainly call you first thing in the morning as soon as I have all of the facts. But we just have to be very super sensitive about this because it's still a student record and there's still confidentiality that, ha that is in place. Miss Rucker, Miss Rucker, if you want to talk and meet with them later, that'll be just fine, but not during the meeting. Right. We'll take action on your concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yes. As I said, we normally don't uh, no. do that, but this to me is a, a very sensitive situation and we just need to make sure that not just even with this situation, um, we're doing whatever we need to do, putting things in place to make sure that we're not seeing this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we have board updates. Um, Dr. Hall, we <clears throat> you had sent some information regarding couple board members, I guess three board members. Uh, it was uh, Jennifer Gasparro, Jean, Janine Galbert, and Mike Ture being, being looked at, I guess, or investigated for violating Open Meetings Act in some manner. And I saw, I believe it was on March the 2nd or 3rd that you sent a, another reply as far as that investigation was concerned that it was emphatically denied by the three board members that they engaged in any type of open meeting act violation. So I just want to know if there's any follow-up 
or any more information regarding that. You mean, I mean, follow up? Yeah, I need more information regarding the state's attorney investigation on that matter. Any um, more information? With, with, with that situation. Is that closed session information or what? No, it's not closed session. Um, basically, what, what's typically done in that situation is when board members are accused of wrong wrongdoing or whatever, um, it goes to our lawyers pretty much handle it. So everything was forwarded to the lawyers. And um, there was, I guess, an investigation done. And uh, it was said by our board members that it did not occur. So our lawyers have so many days to get a response back to the attorney general's office. And then they forwarded. it. So everything I forwarded to the school board members was forwarded to the attorney general's office, basically a reply. And um, I believe it was affidavit signed. And they went over to the uh, attorney general's office. I haven't gotten any type of response. I don't even know if there is a next step or response or whatever back to the board, but that's pretty much what occurred. No allegations or, or uh, what the violations was, was about or nothing like that or not. This is it, just what you sent out. That's all the information that you have. That's all the information yes. we have. <laughs> Yeah, it was um, the actual letter that comes to us states what the allegations were and outlines, you know, whatever the proposed activity or, or whatever alleged activity was. So that's in the letter. But again, like I said, I just pretty much forwarded to the attorneys and they took it from there. And I believe they called all three board members and um, spoke with them individually. So I don't know what they would have to say that, but I don't know how that went or what questions were asked. It's all a matter of public record, Mo. If you want to look it up, you can look it up. Just our attorneys will provide that to you. It's public record. It was an allegation about some somewhere sometime during the conference they saw the three of us together at the triple i conference which you know there's 500 700 school board members <clears throat> everybody together and that's basically what is the allegation was and some other things that were no specifics no dates no times no places it's all public record you can uh, look it up and you can see our response you have the exact same information that we have. That was all. That was it. Just that letter. And this was at the conference uh, when last year, this year, or wouldn't there normally year? be a response back from the attorney general <laughs> in answer to our response? So we. That's correct. Our defense is, or the defense of these three, is that it didn't happen, and those affidavits were forwarded to the. Yes, that's the last attorney thing that we've got. Um, our our attorneys told us they're about two years behind, just so don't hold your response? breath on. Typically, the attorney general's office would send us a response, but it takes time. You know, sometimes those responses are months, and I think we had a response that ended up coming back um, six, eight months after the investigation last time. The attorney did tell us it could take up to two years or longer. So it was just the allegations that uh, three board members were seen at the I triple, I triple. It's exactly conference. what you saw. The paperwork you saw is exactly what we saw. There's no difference in it. There was no more information given to us than what was in the packet. Is that what it said? The I triple. That you guys triple I conference. Triple I. Is that of what was this said in there? of 2016. I'm sorry. I said the Triple I conference of triple of 2016. Okay. So no further information. Not at this time. Um, I guess what Dr. Cunningham said. They should be responding back. 
We will get a response. We just don't know when. Thank you. Thank you. Also on the board updates, um, I'd like to say, I believe we need some clarity. Um, I've been contacted by some staff members inquiring about, uh, there must be a rumor regarding the insurance um, that was agreed upon even last week. Board Member Gaspero and I were answering a question regarding how we came to um, whatever the insurance benefits are. And there was a committee and, you know, people have been asking me about that. I was not on that committee. Uh, we had two board members, Ms. Gaspero and Ms. Galbraith, that were on that committee. I think people need to understand the process that goes into some of the decisions that are made because they assume that the board did this or the board did that and just trying to explain to people the process um, because what it seems like staff members don't always understand the process. Um, that and then there's a rumor that when we approve the increases for non-certified staff that an administrator got $25,000 increase. So I've, I've been asking because I'm like, I don't know anything about a $25,000 increase. So I need us to address that because I believe it's very important to get the facts out so people will understand what transpired. Real quickly, just uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Williams about insurance, um, we have not approved anything because we're going through each and every one of the administrators, the non-certified contracts. No money has been given to anyone, so I don't know where they got 25000 and I know of no plan to give a $25,000 raise to any administrator. I know of no plan at all. I don't know where that came from. Um, and once we finished all of this, we'll ensure that that's not what we have. Well, it's being told to staff, just so you know that. Well, we're not even done. I, well, it's, um, probably, it's probably called a, a election year, and you're going to see a lot of mess and unfactual information going out. So, but the public need to know the truth and make decisions on selecting candidates of their choice based on truthful information. So if information come out there that it appears that it's coming from the school in a non-factual manner, it need to be addressed. Yes, so, sir. So $25,000, you're saying that that was not the case? That is not the case. No raises have been given. The approval of the system is what we got. We're going through it right now. Once we're all finished, then raises will be out there. I don't know where they would have gotten $25,000 for an administrator. Um, Dr. Williams, can you go over the process because you are our representative on the insurance committee and include the members if you can remember them? I, I was just about to start <laughs> by apologizing because this was several months ago. Um, but in the CMEA contract, it does have language relating to an insurance committee. On the insurance committee, we had members of the Board of Education, members of ACME, members of CMEA, as well as administration. Um, from central office. I believe Mr. Neal, were you on the committee with me? So Mr. Neal and I represented um, central office. The committee probably met six times. Who was oh, the members of the board? Um, Ms. Gas Ms. Gasparo, Gasparo and Ms. Galbraith were members of the board that represented the board during that time. I believe we met about six times. Please correct me if you remember anything differently, but um, we met five or six times over a two and a half month period. Um, the initial meetings were to educate the committee as to what the options were, what our current plan provided. Um, as we moved through the process, we learned about options to consider. We looked at how much they would save us over time. And then the committee actually voted on the different options and the savings associated with them. Um, 
the recommendation of the committee was then presented to the Board of Education and the Board of Education supported the committee's recommendation to make changes to the plan accordingly. So all of those changes, there were representatives from all the stakeholder groups impacted um, on the committee and the recommendations of that committee were bought, brought to the full board mm -hmm. and accepted by the full board. So everything that you guys collectively came to an agreement, filtered everything out before it became so a product to come to the full board. To yes, work. absolutely. Thank you. My, my comment was that this committee came together and filtered everything out and said, this is our final product. And you brought it to the board as a recommendation to approve. At one point, there was even a flow chart that started with a base. These are your options. This is what it would increase the premium. This is what how much the premium would decrease. We went through everything, agreed on everything, and came up with a bottom line. So yeah. I mean, they looked at individual cases even. There were some people who were taking very expensive drugs, how this would affect them, um, the different urgent care facilities, how this would affect them, which way they went. Um, there were many questions that were asked at a meeting, and the next time they came back, they had it all ready for us with the answers. And if those weren't thorough enough or did, weren't understandable, they were discussed. So there was a lot of talk and a lot of input from the members of that committee with the, are they insurance brokers? Is that right, Ann? Yes. Okay. Yes. And as part of um, that process, for individuals that did have specialty drugs that were significant in cost, the brokers provided alternatives that they could consider. If there weren't alternative drugs that they could consider, they talked to them about talking to their doctors about a combination of other drugs that would meet the same requirement of the drug that they were taking. So um, we, I believe we made a very good attempt to address all of the concerns of everyone involved and even those that weren't involved that were talking to members of the committee about their personal situation. So I believe that our due diligence was above and beyond. Reproach. And just reiterate there, there were uh, members from CMEA Yes. On this committee. There were members from CMEA from and ACME, ACME on the committee. Yes. Thank you. Were there any non-certs other than the administrators? Just, uh, just administrators. Uh, we had building administrators and district administrators, the board members. Um, that, so the administrators represented the non-certified staff or the non-union non staff. Union staff. I'm sorry, non-union staff. There are equal numbers of union and non-union on the committee by by MOA with both unions. And this process will start up again here in another month or two uh, for the coming year. So we do this on an annual basis. So yes, there were non-certified members. ACME members were represented. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so CMEA, do we require like representation from elementary and high school? How does, how does that work? The Is union just, um, represented, the union had determined who would come from their, for their committees. Do the presidents normally sit on that committee? Um, in this particular case, Ms. Bragg sat on the committee. I don't believe Ms. New. Both said, presidents were Was Ms. New on the committee? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I believe we had, um, I know we had a, a high school teacher. We had a custodian. I don't I, without going back to my notes, I couldn't yeah. tell you who was on the committee. I'm sorry. I'll get some notes out to the board to make sure that we can get okay. that out, who exactly was on the committee, mm -hmm. how they were represented. You, know, you don't have to do that. I just wanted to just ensure that we had a good representation of our staff and yes. a good understanding by our unions. Yes, the of, union, the union heads were there. Okay as well as other union members. So it wasn't just the union president, there were other union members that represented their membership. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. My last update you all, um, if you look through your handout from the National School Boards Association, uh, this is an issue brief that they put out on the proposed American Health Care Act, which would repeal and replace portions of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, the National School Boards Association is urging board members 
to call their st their legislators in regards to this proposed change because it would greatly affect our students and what they receive through our districts. So if you look at the three bullet points on the first page, pretty much outlines um, what would be affected. So this will require states to make decisions about what services are covered due to a decrease in federal support. States will likely factor costs over services when deciding what to cover for children with disabilities. And this in turn could place pressure on school districts and schools to finance health services required under individualized education programs or IEPs for children with disabilities who were previously covered under Medicaid. So um, it is being urged by NSBA that we reach out to our legislators and uh, make sure that they know how this will greatly impact our students, particularly our students who receive IEPs um, and NSBA is not in support of this change. So I just wanted to make that up. Thank you, everyone. Administrative updates, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you. The Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Program has named Money Education Center and Creed Elementary Schools as mix it up model schools for their exemplary efforts to foster respect and understanding among their students and throughout their campuses during the 2016-2017 school year. MEC and Creed Elementary are among 76 schools to receive the honor. I've said this before and I'll say it again. We continue to be an award-winning school district because of our excellent students, motivated staff, dedicated administrative administration, and supportive community. Mix It Up Day lunch is a simple call to action. Our schools ask students to move out of their comfort zones and connect with someone new over lunch. The event encourages students to identify, question, and cross social boundaries. The Mix It Up model schools met five criteria. They each hosted a Mix Up Day lunch during the 2016-2017 school year. They included different members of the school community, cafeteria staff, aides, administrators, teachers, and students in organizing the event. They followed up with at least two additional Mix It Up related programs or events on campus, and they publicized the Mix It Up lunch or celebrated the inclusiveness with posters, announcements, and other media. And their event was seen by students and school officials as a success. We definitely saw this as a success. I thank all of the board members and other administrators who were able to get out uh, to the schools and participate during this Mix It Up Day. The district is proud of the Monia Education Center and Creed Elementary for their great work at finding innovative ways to create environments of respect and inclusiveness. The Teaching Tolerance Program has hosted Mix It Up Day for the past 15 years to help students demonstrate the importance of respecting each other's differences. The 2017 event will be held on October 31st. Again, I congratulate the MEC and Creed Elementary for the outstanding work. Thank you. Congratulations to both of our schools. And we got a little taste of what our school did this evening. Well, it's wonderful that um, all of our schools participated in that and having two schools in the same district to be recognized nationally, that's an outstanding achievement. And the work that they do and the way that our kids take to it, it it's, it's outstanding. And I know you guys have all had the opportunity to see that. It, it's wonderful when we get a chance to make sure the public knows about it. And this is our fourth year doing this. And um, I believe we have schools recognized every year. We and have. Creep may have been recognized. How many times have you guys been recognized? Is it every year? All right. Yeah. Great job. Great job. Next, we have Student Affairs, Dr. Clark, FOIA request update. Bear with me. Ooh. I have four updates for you. Thank you. Thank you. February 003 was the last report for February. Um, full investigation on Ms. Burchette's actions. I would like to know if this person is an employee of the district. I would also like to know if he was fingerprinted and background checked according to district policy. 
I would ask that the school video cameras be retrieved and made available for discovery and to aid in the investigation Monday 13 and Wednesday 15th and all information concerning this activity according to law. Requester Mr. Uh, Foy, response after clarification. March 2nd, 2017, FOIA was partially fulfilled. There are no documents responsive to personnel investigations and or video cameras that can or may be part of a personnel investigation. March 7th, after clarifying this person, there are no documents responsive to this request. March 001, list of police officers assigned to schools, districts, agreements with the police departments, all arrests made inside a school and offense during the 2015-16 school year through the 2016-2017 school year. Michelle McBickaney, and I apologize if I'm mispronounced, Wiley. Um, this FOIA is still in progress. It was partially fulfilled at this time. There were no documents responsive to the arrest made in the school, and there are no police officers um, assigned directly to our schools for the workday. March 002, all emails to, from, between any staff member regarding Kennedy and various spellings or Christian Hall from 2013 to current. Tall Hall is the requester. Request is being treated as a request for student records and is in progress. March 003. The estimated cost absorbed by taxpayers for the four years requested by Tammy Burnham. What percentage of African American students have overall grades of D's and F's for all classes assigned to Mary Bragg? All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and retired employee Susan Duran. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Michael Ture, BOE member. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Michael Einhorn, Village of Crete president. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Jay Farquhar, Village of Moni mayor. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Doris Harmon Warren. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Heidi Gonzalez. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Tammy Burnham. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Kelly Place. All email conversations between Mary Bragg and Cindy Newell from April 2013 to present. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Jen Talent. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Karen Javi, or Have, I apologize, Javi, thank you, of the Vedette newspaper. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Gwendolyn Randolph. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Kara Millsap. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Sandy Walters. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, and, and I'm sorry, union president, and Sheila Barlett. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Vicki Carlos. All email conversation between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Jennifer Gasboro, your e member. All email conversations between Mary Bragg, certified teachers, union president, and Janine Galbraith, BOE member. All email conversations between Michael Ture, Creek Monique, 201 U, district employee, teacher, and Mike, Michael Ture, BOE member. All email conversations between Susan Duran, retired employee, and Mike Ture, BOE member. All email conversations between Cindy New and Michael Ture, BOE member. All email conversations between Cindy New and Gwendolyn Randolph. All email conversations, Gwendolyn Randolph and Michael Ture, BOE member. All email conversations between former employee Daniel Bohm and Michael Mike Ture, BOE member. All email conversations between former employee Daniel Bohm and Mary Bragg. All email conversations between Jean Cahan and Mike Ture. All email conversations between Jean Cahan and Mary Bragg. All expenses paid by the district for Mary Bragg Certified Teachers Union President for any out of town or in town traveling, fine dining, and hotel accommodations. All email conversations between former employee Daniel Bohm and Jennifer Gasparro, BOE member. 
all email conversations between Kelly Place and Mary Bragg, Certified Teachers Union President, BOE member. All thousands of dollars of expenses paid by the 201U School District for Michael Teray, BOE member, including the cost for dinners and hotel accommodations for him and his family in Chicago, New Orleans, Nashville, Tennessee, and Boston, Massachusetts. In addition, all expected and expended expenses paid by the district for the upcoming trip to Denver, Colorado. All thousands of dollars in expense paid by the district for Jennifer Gasparro, BOE member, including the cost for dinners and hotel accommodations in Chicago and Boston for her and her family. In addition, all expected and expended expenses paid by the district for the upcoming trip to Denver, Colorado. All thousands of dollars in expenses paid by the district for Janine Galbraith, the BOE member, including the cost of dinners at hotel accommodations in Chicago and Boston for her and her family. In addition, all expected and expanded expenses paid by the district for the upcoming trip to Denver, Colorado. All emails from Judith Pappas since her hiring by the district of 201U. Janine Gabbard was seen with the colleague graduate robe and hood during an official district ceremony that indicated that she is a college graduate, but her bio on the school webpage does not indicate such. Please provide what college she attended and what degree she was awarded. All emails, conversations between Tara Wagner and Mike Teray, BOE member. All emails, conversations between Tara Wagner and Janine Galbraith, BOE member. All email conversations between Tara Wagner and Jennifer Gasparro, BOE member. <sighs> All of this <laughs> is in progress. We um, have no response at this time. Thank you. Sorry, you had to read that. <laughs> I have a question. Last month we had a FOIA request and I believe it was Mr. Brown that um, one of them, you were named in the FOIA and you asked why you had not been notified. Why, if we're, if there is a board member or a staff member that is part of a FOIA, why do we not know about it until it becomes public on board book? Can you tell me what the process is, please? You should receive the information when I receive it because it comes to um, myself as well as the superintendent. Until we get clarification as to the response is probably why you were not notified and I have not received the, um, the response from the attorneys at this time. So to answer your question, you would be notified by the superintendent. Thank you. Next update, curriculum, growth process structure, information. Is this a presentation or we? No, um, Mr. Neal's gonna uh, put a slide up on the board that oh, this I- This is the um, one we have. And you have it on paper okay. so that the audience can see what, what I'm referring to. Okay. Thank you. Um, at our committee of the whole meeting last week, um, I gave the board the uh, winter uh, local growth model report um, and we had a, a discussion where we, there were some questions about how the results of that report connect to teachers and students in the classroom. And um, often we're talking about parts of a system and I thought tonight it would be a good opportunity to kind of provide a big picture as to where all of the pieces, how they all fit together. Um, so what I've given you is a graphic of that and um, it's up here on the screen. Um, as you can see, um, we use standardized assessment data to support learning, student learning throughout the entire system. Um, so hopefully this, um, this graphic will kind of connect the dots for everyone. Um, you can see at the top of the, uh, the model here is our local growth model report. And that's kind of a culminating report, um, which is why obviously it's at the top. Um, after each uh, assessment period where we give a standardized assessment, um, the ECRA group takes our standardized assessment data and um, creates this local growth model report for us. Um, it brings together all of the test data and it puts it into a single growth score. And then um, I, think, I think a good analogy for that is like a report card grade where a classroom teacher is looking at a lot of different 
pieces of student work and has information on all of those pieces, whether it's a project, a, a paper, a class assignment, a test, a quiz, and all those different pieces come together to create one grade for a subject that appears on a report card. And that's, that's really what the local growth model report is. It's taking um, a, a different uh, assessment pieces of data and bringing it to a, grow, a single growth score. Um, so um, what the local growth model does is then it, it takes the score and it color codes it. So it's a nice, easy to understand type of model. So it'll color code the growth, uh, the growth metric either as blue, which means it's higher than expected growth. Green means it's expected growth. Um, yellow means it's lower than expected growth. And red means that it's on satisfactory growth. Um, kind of like the same idea as, or, as the grades on a report card. Um, we get, um, this is our third round of growth model reports. Uh, they built our local growth model and it was done about this time last year. So we have had uh, a spring report from last spring, which was then translated to our academic report in the fall. Um, we had fall data, which I presented to you in the winter, and then our winter data, which I just presented to you last week. Um, the, um, now that we're doing this, our district and our school data gives us growth scores for the school as a whole. Um, it gives us growth scores for grade levels, both at the district level, which is what I gave you last week. Um, but as in a school report, it would be for the school grade levels. Um, it also gives us information at a district level for our subgroups and at the school level for the subgroups as well. And now we're starting to work with ECRA to get that data down, that growth score down to an individual student metric, and that will be coming soon. Um, so the, the, the standardized tests that you see at the top, we basically have three that go into the model. Uh, for our seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, and 11th, so middle school, high school students, um, we now have the SAT suite of assessments, which includes the SAT at 11th grade, which is our state assessment. We also have our um, PSAT series of tests, so the National Merit Qualifying Test, and our uh, PSAT for grades eight and nine. And next year, we'll be adding seventh grade into the mix, just like we did with the Explore Plan and ACT, so our seventh graders get a jump start on that. That's, the, that's kind of the middle school, high school assessment. It's based on proficiency, um, and that's uh, aligned to state standards. Um, the other um, assessment that we use at grades K-8 is our NWEA MAP assessment, and that's a growth assessment, so it's an adaptive test, so every student gets on and the assessment adjusts to become harder or easier depending on whether students get questions right or wrong. This one we give for K-5, um, we do it fall, winter, and spring, and for uh, 6, 7, and 8, we do it fall and spring. And that, again, is a growth assessment. And then the last assessment that goes into this model is our park assessment. And that is for students in grades three through eight. That, again, is our state assessment. It's given in the spring. And um, it's based on proficiency. So what you'll see here is that in the fall, we have um, a couple of assessments that are included in the growth model. It will be our fall testing with our SAT series of assessments, as well as our NWEA MAP. Um, when you get to the spring, you add park to the mix. We have multiple assessments that go into the growth model. And in the winter, we basically have our MAP test. And the only grade that we have um, at middle school is eighth grade, which is their PSAT 8 that we take. High school has no assessments. So the, the middle of the year is more like a, a, a touch base type of thing, as opposed to a real um, robust type of um, assessment period that we have. Um, when, you, when you look at this, you can see that these, these assessments work their way up to the local growth model report, but our system also works its way down, and I'm, I'm just using that as kind of an analogy. But our test data, each one of those tests brings data to our district and to our schools. And when you look moving downward on the graphic, you'll see that our, our middle school and high school will use the SAT suite of assessment data. They use it to help develop their school improvement plans. They use it to align their curriculum to whatever the student learning needs are based on their data. Um, it goes down into classroom instruction where teachers are planning for, 
for you know their daily lessons and their units. Um, they're developing their assessments in their classroom, whether they're formative assessments, which they're giving feedback to students on how they're doing, or their summative assessments that are graded, um, could be observation. Um, they also design their assessments with questions that students may encounter on one of these assessments. So if a, if a state assessment is giving us a, a question where students have to write a written response or where they have a multi-part question, they will try to incorporate those types of questions into their classroom assessments. So again, we're trying to make those connections. And then the other piece that happens in classrooms is just kind of around test preparation. You know, we've moved to online assessments in the last couple of years. So some of what we do is getting students used to the online platform. We get them used to, um, uh, you know, how to, how to manipulate the features of that online assessment, whether they are using a mouse, whether there's highlighting, um, how to drag and drop things to answer questions. Um, even math even has formulas and, and math symbols that have to be manipulated online. So that test prep does happen at the classroom level. And then from those assessments, we move into what we're doing at the student level, which is differentiating instruction based on individual student needs. And that's where our intervention periods come in. Um, at, the, you know, at the high school, we're adding an intervention period next year called um, the hero period. Um, middle school has their ramp period, our intervention blocks at K-5 for reading and math. So now we're getting down to what individual students need based on their performance. And then um, we also have specific courses at middle school and high school that may give students an extra boost of reading or math. Um, we're running after school programs and summer schools. So the system as a whole, our state and our standardized assessment data, not only do they work their way up to create a local growth score for us, but they're also drilling their way down to get from the district level to the school level to the classroom level to the student level. And um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of provide some clarity, not only for the board, but for the public, because so often I'm reporting on just bits and pieces of this, and it really fits within a larger framework. So I don't know if anybody has any, any questions or comments on that. Thank you, Laura, for that. I will say, um, for those who do not know, I know that as a state and even on the federal levels, we are moving towards the growth, the growth model um, versus proficiency. Um, there was something that uh, I believe the ISBE, did they file their draft? I, I mean, are they doing the April or the September? Day? They're doing the April. They are going that was what go I heard at the last meeting that I was at. Their plan is for, hear anything to different? submit it for I know April. That the, April was the last thing I heard. When I was in uh, Springfield last month, I couldn't be here for the board meeting, but called in, um, the governor addressed the uh, members of ISB that were there. Um, well, it was actually all of the Vision 2020 Alliance. Um, and he said he was urging ISB to not submit for the April deadline, but to take time to get more input Mm -hmm. um, I know they did tons of listening tours and, and things like that. So um, he was encouraging them to uh, submit for the September deadline. Um, I, I applaud ISBE for taking the time. I think they, they took almost a year, I think, going around the state, talking to all you know levels of stakeholders, um, and they support the growth model, which was repetitively shared. Um, I think we need to agree on what percentage um, will go towards academic and then non-academic factors. Last I heard, we were 50-50, I think, but I'm not sure where it is now when we when we measure accountability for our districts. Have you heard any? I haven't any? heard anything. Uh, the presentation that I went to um, in February was more or less just on what would be included in those in that model. Um, I think some of the you know some of what's happening now is with the uncertainty um, with um, ESSA, ESSA at the federal level. Um, even the template that they're submitting on now has changed. So I think that the states are trying to um, figure out just exactly what they need to do. 
Um, I know Illinois has gone above and beyond with the requirements, even as they were in terms of um, going out and, and having those listening tours for each draft of their plan, which is something that no other state has done. So they've really done their due diligence um, with getting stakeholder input, but I think there's a little bit of uncertainty now about actually what will be submitted. I know that one of the major things being talked about was um, teacher qualifications or, mm -hmm. you know, that possibly changing. Um, so I know, yeah, there are a few things that, well, major things that is causing some hesitancy as far as moving forward. ESSA was put into law, I believe, December 2015. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but it was it's within the last 12 to 15 months they mm -hmm. voted on it. Okay. Because they've been working on it now. I think I think since the fall of 15, they've been working on the draft. And so there's there's changes that are coming that require us to mentally change our, you know, mm -hmm. mentally will change our mentality, I should say, um, in regards to accountability, in regards to measuring um, whether our students are successful. Yes. And I just want to stress, you know, especially to the public, um, with going to the growth model, what was happening previously when you're looking at proficiency, um, you're neglecting certain factors. So if you have a if you're a teacher and you have students that come into your class at a certain grade level, let's just say they're in fifth grade, but they're at third grade, and you're basically uh, held accountable to get that child to increase two years worth of reading, and not only that, be prepared to go to sixth grade, mm -hmm. you know that's a lot to require. So. What this growth model does is it gives you um, the opportunity to show, to basically to celebrate the fact that the student did grow. And that's really what we want with our students. We want them to, we want evidence of them growing. We want evidence that, you know, they have learned certain concepts. So this is a huge change, I would say. We've talked about it for some years, but for it now to be embraced on the state level, I think is huge because a lot of people felt like we were penalized so much when it came down to measuring the success of students. And that's one of the reasons why No Child Left Behind changed so much mm -hmm. over the course of you know, its time. So um, I am thankful that we're now recognizing that we want our kids to increase and we're not penalizing teachers if their children didn't make these multiple years and in yeah. increases. It's, it's a nice, I, I think the state has a, a, a solid model. It's based on, you know, under NCLB, it was one test score. And then they would determine whether or not you were, you know, a failing school or not. But this is a multiple measure. Um, framework, you know, different different measures for high school than elementary, but still multiple measures, and growth is in, is one of those measures. So it, it's I I think it's a solid plan. What I really like here, Laura, is the growth the local growth model that you have here. It it not only talks about the summative because that's where it was way back when you know it was a summative model. We got one grade for the entire year. Now we're looking at growth. And it's not only summative, but it's formative. And your up and down arrows is showing that summative, the formative portion of, of this model. So that the information that we get from our tests that we're taking three times a year is given back to our teachers so that they can make adjustments in the teaching Correct. so that they can make sure that we're getting as much growth and, and knowledge from our students as possible. That is, I mean, it's an outstanding model and I, I applaud you for it. I know I said that earlier <laughs> in my office, but I don't mind saying it again here in the public. Thank you. And lastly, one thing I, I like about it is, you know, not every child, you know, does well on a certain test. You know, some students, you know, when you look at standardized testing, don't do as well, you know, um, and not every child does the same on a formative assessment and a summative. So, again, that's one of the great things, too. Thank you. 
I got a couple of questions. Um, you were talking about, you know, they take the test and if they don't do well, they go to an easier question. Um, and then I, I assume that's, and tell me if I'm wrong, that's to tell you they're behind on something and then they go to the intervention. Is that correct? It, that's the, the middle. The middle one. Uh, middle right. one, and that is, it's an adaptive assessment. So what the test will do is a student will answer three questions, and based on how they answer the first three questions, the questions then get either harder or easier. And as they get more correct, the questions become more difficult, and if they are not correct, the questions get easier. So sometimes, and I think most of our teachers have gone through this experience where they're, they're giving this test, and our students that are getting answers right are getting harder questions, and they tend to get frustrated and think they're not doing well because the questions are getting harder. Um, but what, what that particular assessment does when all is said and done and we get the reports back is it tells us, and if you move down to the third box in that um, column there, it tells us exactly what students are ready to learn. That's a report that we get. And when we get that report, then we're able to then differentiate instruction during our intervention blocks and our classroom, like guided small group reading instruction, small group math. Um, we're able to, to address those students' learning needs um, at that time with that data. And to, to go to your point, Mr. Trey, that's, that data that we get, not only will it tell us what students are ready to learn, but we do get a score that tells us whether or not they're performing that, that score that they earned is at grade level, above grade level, below grade level. Okay, and then when they get to the intervention block, do they have, uh, are we satisfied or competent uh, that all of our intervention people are qualified and do we have an adequate amount of numbers to bring these kids, you know, the, the ultimate goal I, I would assume is to bring them up to grade level. Do we have enough teachers with enough qualifications and specialties to bring these children up to grade level? Um, that's the next question and I got a couple others. Um, I think, well, some of our interve our intervention blocks are not only um, staffed by specialists like a reading specialist or math specialist, but they're also it's also our our general education teachers that are involved in that as well. I think if you if you ask any any school if they have enough staffing, they'll tell you no. <laughs> That's just generally um, you know more hands the better. Um, and in some cases, some schools have more staff than others, um, but it's, you know, some of it, some schools have greater needs than others. So it's, it's, uh, we always struggle with the, um, the, you know, fair is not always equal. If some, if some places have data that shows they have greater needs, they need more people versus other places. So, um, you know, do we have enough staff? I think right now we've done a, a great job balancing our, um, our, our need for extra pairs of hands or extra staff with what our budget allows. Um, and we're making use of everybody that we have on staff, even, even our specialists, even our PE and art teachers at times have done interventions with students. So mm -hmm. we're making the, the most that we can with the staff that we have. Okay, well, that leads me, you know, to a comment, I guess. You know, this growth model, I, you know, I understand the concept that Susie or Joey is growing, but what bothers me is by the time they get to the 12th grade, has Susie or Joey got to the point where they're a 12th grader and they can go out into this cold world and compete? Or have they grown from third grade level to now they're at sixth grade level and they're graduating from the 12th grade? And you know, their their future looks pretty bleak if they can't compete with the children that are at 12th grade level to either go on with education or go in the workforce or pursue some type of a, a career. So how does growth model bring them up to 12th grade level by the time they graduate so they can compete in the world? How does that happen, Laura? Well, I, th I think you, you have to look, and I think Dr. Hall alluded to this, is 
you know, you have to look at how far students are behind. I mean, you're only going to be able to move students so fast. I'm not going to be able to take a student that is four years behind and close that four-year gap in one year. Um, so that that's one piece to it. I think the, the other piece to it is um, our interventions are designed, and any intervention that I've researched, that we've we've looked at, I think the best that we that I've seen out there is that we can make up almost a year in a year. So you know, we expect students to get a year's worth of growth for a year year's worth of instruction, but for students in intensive interventions, I think the most you can hope to gain, based on the research that I've seen for all the interventions that are out there, is that they gain an extra year. So it takes you a while to close that gap. Um, the other point is that if we're looking at this just based on, and I'm just talking about based on these three standardized assessments, we have students that do not do well on standardized assessments. They may be able to write a wonderful paper, stand up and give the most dynamic presentation and, and do classwork that is outstanding. But when it comes to sitting down and taking a test, they don't do as well. So I don't think it's, and I think this is the kind of the failing that we had with NCLB, is that it's relying on a test score to determine whether or not students are prepared, are at a grade level. And I don't think we should fall into the trap of just relying on a single piece of evidence to determine whether well, or not students I, are I understand ready. that, but you know, I think when the rubber meets the road, when they go to the university, the university wants to know what their grade level is, what their test, they, they take the SAT now, the ACT before, if they can't take the test, they score a 15 on the ACT in the past or whatever, what's the SAT now, 1600 is tops or mm -hmm. whatever? Yes. Say they score a thousand on it and Susie and Joey are wonderful kids in the classroom. The universities, all, they're interested in that grade, you know, and I, I wish it weren't that way, you know, I wish it weren't that way for my sons when they got football scholarships, you know. If they'd have scored 30s on their SAT, I'd, I'd have saved a ton of money, you know. But that's the reality of it, you know. It's it's based on the score. I don't like it. I'd like to throw all these tests away if it were up to me. I don't think they're doing a whole lot of good, you know, and because what you said, children can excel and they can, you know, but this is the this is what we're stuck with. And when they go on to further education, you're stuck with that test score. So how, how do you bring this child that's in a growth model, how do you bring him up so he or she can score a good grade to get into college? Well, I think, you know, more and more, college is considered more than just the, the college entrance score. I mean, it's one piece of a portfolio. Well, but money, they're, obviously, you know. Well, you they're looking at grades, they're looking at extracurriculars, they're looking at community service, they're looking at the application. I mean, there's a lot of things that colleges look at. So, yes, the score is, is important, but again, it, it, we're, we're trying, uh, students are applying and trying to create a, a or deliver a, a portfolio of of their work and their achievements to to get them entrance into college. So um, even some some schools now are even going away from looking at the test scores um, for the very reason that you pointed out. It's not always a true and valid measure of what a student can do. Well, I hope so because I spent a fortune putting my four kids through school. But I I have a, the last question I have is special needs kids. What are we doing with the special needs kids as far as this testing and are they tested as a separate group and in a different type of testing or how does that work? Well, all of the, um, the state tests, the SAT, the PARC and the, and the PSAT that um, students take, they're all given uh, those tests with the accommodations that are listed in their IEPs. And then um, NWEA, because it's an adaptive assessment, it will adapt to where the student is, but there is also there are also accommodations um, that students can have with that. It's just a little trickier because it's not every test isn't the same. So if we were all taking a test, each one of us would be looking at a different question because the assessment is individual to us. So uh, Mrs. Bellotti and I have had several conversations recently about how do we implement those IEP accommodations for MAP testing and what is it that can reasonably be done 
And, um, you know, it, for us, um, special education students often have other assessments that, that we have, that we use with them as well. So um, what she's looking at is, um, especially for MAP, it's just one piece of data in a, in a large picture. Um, but they are given their testing accommodations for these assessments. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. I was just gonna also add uh, briefly, when you look at the growth model, it the, the reality is we get kids that, you know, mobilize into our district and um, we cannot control what level they're at, reading, math, whatever. And uh, when, you, when you don't look at growth, you're basically penalized if you did not, and I keep saying penalized, but you know what I mean. Um, if you did not, yes, but you get what I'm saying. It's, it's, yes. it's been something that's been, you know, discussed for years, you know, and, and I believe that uh, Mr. Ture, I, I believe our teachers, you know, do the best uh, jobs to do that. But there's so many different factors that go into um, student growth that, that affect student growth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can try to, you know, move a student for years. And in my opinion, like, or the, like the example you gave, um, but in my opinion, that's, that's a miracle. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to add that too. Thank you. Next, we have the consent agenda approval. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved. Moved by Mrs. Galbraith. Second by Mr. Brown. Mr. Cunningham. Uh, consent A, a Superintendent uh, A1, approve IHSA membership 2017-2008. Two, regular meeting minutes for Friday, February 21st, 2017. Three, committee of the whole meeting minutes for March 14th, 2017. Four, approve water well easement intergovernmental agreement with the Village of Crete. Five, youth government day field trip approval. B, for business. One, approve accounts payable. Two, approve payroll. Three, approve FY16 end of year treasurer's report. Four, approve 2015-2016 independent audit. C, uh, curriculum one, approve amended calendar for 2016-2017. D, district affairs, approve uh, board policy two, colon 125 and five, colon 60. Two, approve resolution to adopt travel expenses policy and procedure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, secretary, please call the roll. I do have one correction to the okay. minutes of February 21, 2017 on page 17. The second bullet uh, where we were talking about fundraising, why fundraising activities are allowed for trips that may have already occurred. My question was they were doing fundraising after the final payment was due. Those, that final payment is due before the trip occurs. So can we get that clarified? I'm sorry, Ms. Galbraith, which page are you on? 17. The Which bullet? I'm sorry. Which bullet, ma'am? Regular meeting minutes of February 21st, the mm -hmm. second bullet. Okay. When we talked about the fundraising, I was asking why the fundraising activities were allowed uh, when the final payment had already been turned in, not when the trip had already occurred. Well, that needs to be changed to are allowed for trips that final payment has been made instead of that may have already occurred. Yes. Okay, so we need to amend those minutes, Ms. Mrs. Tobin. I also have one question. Um, what is the current membership for Illinois High School Association? What are the fees? I'm, I'm missing it here somewhere. Is it down there? I'm I'm trying to find it and I, I can't. Can you keep down there? 
I'm on uh, no idea what page. Yeah. 12, page 12, correct, 12, it just shows us part of the organization, which is a, another story, but how much is this costing us? Page 12, 11, 12, I guess. Is there a dollar amount there that I'm missing? Or? It's about $4,200 for the entire thing. Is that what you said? 4200 bucks per year. Oh, my God. 307 Oh, that might be the different one. That might be the wrong. Mm -mm. No, that's not it. He's talking about IHSA. The, the, the cost. For what? For IHSA membership. Oh, okay. For our athletics. Oh, sorry. Jim, do you know Dr. Harden? Because it looks like they didn't indicate that in the letter to you, mm -mm. which is interesting. Kind of like an open end check, you know. <laughs> I thought I saw that. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not seeing it anywhere. But. Can we uh, get that information, or should we hold off on this no. till we know? Yeah, I what do you think? don't want to approve something. I don't know what we're paying here. Yeah, we need uh, the amount. Dr. Hall, um, in minutes from 2016, when the IHSA membership was uh, renewed, the point of discussion was um, the annual cost of membership to no charge. That was no charge. So maybe that's why there's no amount here. <laughs> okay, that's that's a first. Uh, um, interesting. Okay. Then it's probably no charge. Uh, they make a lot of money. I didn't know. But officials, all that other. Okay. Th Thank you. I'm sorry. I stand corrected if there's no charge. It doesn't. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are we on to something else? What's the four, what's the four grand for? <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you. Mrs. Gasparro. Um, re, uh, regarding the um, required adoption that we have for travel expenses, we discussed that at the committee the whole meeting. I believe we um, got an email from you earlier today, but yet that amount that you gave us on the email does not coincide with what's on the um, board packet. So I want to make sure that when we're voting, I want to make sure what we're voting on. I didn't think we put a number in the board packet. I thought we were just going to agree. Did we mess up? As it, far as approval, we're approving the resolution and the policy language. Right. Okay, well, there, that, there's a dollar amount in here. That's why okay. I just want to make sure. In the resolution? Or the well, policy? no, in, in the support. That's why I want to make sure what exactly are we doing tonight. Okay. Are we approving an amount or are we just approving the policy? 
We're approving the policy and we have agreed to an amount. I think we agreed to an amount. The I board conference seat, sheet has that information, sir, as well. I'm sorry? The board conference sheet, that addendum, has that information as well. I think that's what Mrs. Gasper okay. was referring right. to. Right, and that amount is what we discussed at our committee, the whole meeting, but right. yeah, we got an email earlier today right. with a different amount, and they are not, that's why I want to see. It is the final amount that I sent today. That's what the board had agreed to. That's what I got from you guys. And we'll make adjustments to make sure that that's right. So the amount is. But, but the, I just, we need to make it clear that it's not a vote on the amount. No, it's not a vote it's on the amount. It's the, um, because the law is not to vote on an amount, the board right. is supposed to come to a consensus on the amount. Mm -hmm. But tonight we're just voting on the language in the resolution okay. and the policy. Thank you. Okay. okay. Mrs. Galbraith, please call the roll. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Gasparro? Aye. Mr. Brown? Nay. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Dr. Hall? Aye. And Mrs. Galbraith is aye. Thank you, motion carries. Action reports, business, approve our lawn mowing bid. Good evening. Dr. Williams. I'm sorry. Good evening. Included in your packet is a recommendation to award the lawn mowing bid. Um, we did go through the regular bid process. A bid opening was held last week and the low bidder was identified um, soon thereafter. I began to negotiate pricing with that vendor, contingent upon receipt of all the documents required in the bid specification. There was one document that was initially not included. I did receive that document this morning, along with um, a letter stating the prices that would be um, honored as a result of our negotiation. Um, your packet provides detail on the bids that were submitted, as well as the financial impact for the recommendation. The total cost of the base bid is $2,500 per mole, which is a decrease of 2% over the prior year. But in addition to that savings, the district will realize savings due to the inclusion of the courtyards in that price, as well as the price being frozen, not only for this season, but for the season next year. Um, the administration recommends that the Board of Education award the bid for lawn mowing services to the lowest responsible bidder, Roy Erickson, for a total base bid of $2,500 per cut for the 2017 and 2018 mowing seasons. Do we have a motion? Thank you. No, we didn't make a motion. We have a motion to approve the lawn mowing bid as outlined. So moved. Moved by Mr. Brown. Second. Second by Mrs. Gasparro. I, I do questions? have a question. Question. I I, I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Trey. Mr. Brown was okay. talking. Uh, Roy Erickson, that's who you are recommending? Yes. Okay, I'm just, maybe I'm just looking at this wrong. I need more clarity on it. The total bid, including the alternate bids, came up with $2,500. Where is that number coming from? That was the number that I negotiated with him after the bid opening. The attachment that you're probably looking at right now are the direct results from the bid opening. At the bottom of that document, it shows you the price that I'm recommending be approved for Roy Erickson, which is less than the original bid amount. The Illinois School Code does allow school districts to negotiate with the low bidder once they've been identified as long as there are no material changes to the specifications presented. It, and I'm good with that, and I understand that, but I think it still needs some clarity because if I look at this from a high level and I look at year one per cut, year two per cut, and go down those numbers, those numbers will not equate to 2,500. And I would only know that if you said you negotiated those prices. It says the total, bid, including alternate bids, is this price. And I would think that I'm 25. Sorry. I'm I sorry. didn't hear the very last part of what I you said. I said the total bid, including alternate bids, and you have these two prices, year one, $2,500, year two, $2,500. Mm -hmm. I would think 
those numbers were the numbers that were added up in the column. So, so I should from looking a, at this, how, how would a, a lay person or anybody from that, without knowing what you just said, know that that's the price that where that twenty five hundred dollars came from? All right, that's a negotiated price. I probably should have just put it down maybe. farther on the documents to, to delineate between the original bid and the negotiated price. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, okay. it says total the total bid, including the alternate bids, is $2,500. Yes. And if I ask you again, where did that number come from? It started off here. At 25, it has a total base price of 2550. And then it has the alter alternate bids of X amount of dollars for each school. And that comes up to a figure. So if I were to add all those numbers up, it'd be well over $3,000, $4,000 thereabout, right? Yes. The and totals are on. The, the subtotals rather are listed on his original bid right. um, at the time that I negotiated this though I didn't have documentation from him regarding the breakdown. I do have that now and I could include that in the board packet if you think that would be useful I'm just trying to get clarity on when I the total bid price as the lowest responsible bidder that you are recommending is for this contract of Roy Erickson outdoor maintenance of $2,500 for year one and $2,500 for year two. Is that correct? Yes. And those are negotiated bids. Yes. So at some point, those numbers came up to well over three, dollars $4,000, which yes. you negotiated. Yes. You came up with that. Yes. And then it says the total bid right to the left of that first $2,500, it says total bid including alternates is $2,500 for both years. That's just, it just was unclear unless you, you know, I know that you said it was negotiated, but it doesn't really, maybe you need to put it there. I mean, this is the document we have. Maybe you need to put total bid, negotiating bid came up to this number. That's, I'm just, me. it's just not clear to me. Okay. It's only clear because you told me. Okay. That that's a negotiating price. It says it so, in the first. Um, If that's not clear enough, Mr. This, Brown, I did yeah. receive the breakdown this morning, and I can add that to the packet. Yeah, I, I guess that's still. I mean, I see that final negotiating bid to the left right there with lower bidder, and then you come up these 2,500s. I don't know. Would you like me to add this to the packet? No, I'm good with it. Well, it's, it's, it's water over the dam, so to speak, now. I have a question if you're done. The weed pulling and all of that around the schools, uh, who's going to do it? And what are, is it included in this bid so we don't have our fine teaching staff out there pulling weeds? No, as we discussed at the committee of the whole meeting, that is not part of this bid. This bid is strictly for um, lawn mowing and basic trimming around the areas being mowed. Um, as we did last year, we decreased the scope of work that our in-house maintenance staff does by adding the different, the three additional sites. This year, again, we've decreased the workload for the maintenance staff by adding the courtyards. Our maintenance staff should be able to maintain the weeding and the other uh, maintenance needs for our facilities. In addition to that, Mr. McLean is a certified soil specialist or something of that nature and our maintenance staff can work under him to provide weed pesticides and things of that nature and Mr. McLean assured us at the committee of the whole meeting that he and his staff would take care of that and ensure that it is maintained properly. No he's certified just to apply I forget what the exact uh, to apply uh, oh pesticides. sorry pesticides yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I like soil well, specialists. Well, we'll see soil specialists. Contract, uh, just for clarification, there is trimming and weeding included, but not in, not like in flower beds. 
those are omitted. Um, your, your different planting beds, things like that. Here's the statement in our contract. We'll say trimming and weed removal will be necessary around building perimeters, trees, parking curbs, curb lines, planting beds, playground borders, fences, ball fields, fence lines, and other obstructions. So there, there's a lot of stuff that they weren't doing last year um, when they weren't being watched. And once they started, once we started watching them, or well, okay, so once I got here. <laughs> Um, because there was no real oversight last year until I got here uh, because of the you know, void. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that they weren't doing that they were supposed to be doing, and I think that's going to make a big difference in what you see. By them, do you mean the contractor we hired? The, well, the, yes, the contractor that we hired, once we talked to them, they did start doing more weeding. They did start weeding the curbs, because you know, when I got here, that, that stuff wasn't I just done. wanted to clarify who them was. That's all. So you're talking about the company we had previous was supposed to be doing it. They weren't, and then Correct. And they not, got on, and, you on know, track. They could have been doing it occasionally, but not every time. Um, with oversight, they'll do it every time. Okay. And once they, once they come in and learn a, a, the distance, um, I think it's going to be much better. There still are flower beds. Um, you know, there's going to be areas that take special care. Now, that's not part of the contract. And you, you're going to handle that with it. your guys? We're going to do some of it with our guys. Um, some of it we may create a bit or do under, you know, just as a, a shop shop service. Because, so. mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's unsightly and we, we want it to look good. Uh, what about the, um, maybe you can answer this. Mr. Erickson, is he a local company? Or is, it, or is that the person who owns it or it's just the he's, name? Yeah, uh, he's out of Crestwood. His shop is in Crestwood. I understand that he's... A taxpayer, actually a, a local taxpayer, but his, his company is in a different city. Okay. He made sure he uh, told us that after he won the bid. So he's familiar with the point I was getting at. He's familiar with what we got here, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You know, I haven't seen, are we looking at this as a, a different bid coming our way as far as fertilizing and all of that? What, what's going on with that? Mr. That's, McLean is going to put together a bid a request for proposal on services that he and his staff will not provide. Right now, I'm looking at historical what they've done in the past. I don't know if this is on, um, but we do. We really need to get on our pre-emergent, you know, spring that needs to start happening right now. Uh, of course, it's always tough with the weather. Um, and it's stated, I am a licensed applicator, and we have one licensed operator who can spray under my under my license. And we're getting all that paperwork together so that we can do some more of that in-house like we used to. Um, the licenses have lapsed. There was nobody that our operator could spray under, you know, legally. So now we're, we're legal again as far as that goes. So your license is up? My they're, license is good. They're good for, what, two, three years? Yeah, three years. Three years. Okay. So we are going to embark upon doing some pre-emergent uh, crabgrass preventer. The this then need to happen real grass, soon. Yeah. Okay, so we're not going to miss the boat on that. We have not missed the boat on that yet. We have to, you know, but we have to get on and on. This is the time of year to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Didn't do the motion. I guess I did. Okay, uh, Ms. Galbraith, please call the roll. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mrs. Gasparro? Aye. Mr. Teray? Aye. Dr. Hall? Aye. And Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Next, human resources. Here we go. I won't complain, Dr. Clark. I have a motion to approve the employment of certified staff, the reassignment of certified staff, the leave of absence for certified staff, the return from leave of absence for certified staff, the intent to retire for, certif for certified staff, the resignation of certified staff, the dismissal of certified staff, the employment of educational support staff, the reassignment of educational support staff, the leave of absence for educational support staff, the return from leave of absence of educational support staff, 
the intent to retire of educational support staff, the resignation of educational support staff, and the dismissal of educational support staff. I need a motion. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Galbraith. Second. Second by Mrs. Gasparro. Mr. Neal. Thank you. Our personnel report reads as follows. Our certified staff leave of absence, Mayetta Ali, Janine Bartosh, Joanne Forstall, Michelle Kelly, and Rebecca Murtaugh. Certified staff returning from leave of absence, Kayla Anderson and Erica Maynard. Certified staff resignations, Joanna Boss, Rosalind Shaw, and Ann Williams. Educational support staff, our educational support staff employment, uh, Christy Rankin. Educational support staff reassignment, Philip Puente, Janet Despain, and Deborah Ritnicki. Educational support staff leave of absence, Tanya Perry and Ann Waiter. Educational support staff return from leave of absence, Don Vanderbilt. Educational support staff resignation, Margaret O'Brien, Natalie Watts, Stephanie Jenkins, and Ryan Winterfeld. And finally, educational support staff retirement, uh, Carol Wilmowski. Thank you. Mrs. Galbraith, please call the roll. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Gasparro? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Dr. Hall? Aye. And Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Thank you, motion carries. May I have a motion to approve settlement agreement for non-certified employee? Moved. Moved by Mr. Ture. Second. Second by Mrs. Gasparro. Okay. I have a question, Mr. Neal. I'm trying to find it. information. There is a portion regarding, oh gosh, where is it? A waiver. Something about um, is a waiver of termination. Is that? I'm sorry. I, where is that? What did you say? There's something about termination. Um, I'm sorry, okay, it's in section four, release. It says, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth sentence. Okay. <coughs> I'm just trying to understand does this negate the fact of termination? This, uh, this does negate the termination and requires his resignation. It basically, he gets to resign. Okay. Also, can you verify with the Board of Education what was the basis of I know that our employees that have been terminated can go to arbitration, correct? Correct. What was the basis of this route? This was to uh, avoid the arbitration, uh, the cost of completing this settlement is significantly less than what we would likely incur going through an arbitration. Um, if we, even if we prevailed in the arbitration, uh, and he did not challenge that in court. Uh, obviously, if he went on and challenged that in court, there would be additional costs there. This ends this now, and it does it for a, a, a lesser sum than we would have otherwise paid. Oh, oh, oh I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> um, the basis of the arbitration. 
Uh, yes, that's it. I'm sorry. Uh, the basis of the arbitration was that because uh, I asked Dr. Cunningham, and he told me to ask you. Oh, okay. <laughs> was that he was wrongfully dismissed? Uh, that was the base, the fundamental basis of the arbitration. So basically, he didn't agree with the dismissal. He was that uh, that he was dismissed. That there was insufficient cause for dismissal. That was that was his assertion. So he felt that he was wrongfully dismissed. And then there was information sent to the board. He's basing this off of what happened with another employee. Um, or something. It's, there was it's something not based off of that. It was it was alluded to as part of, through the process of discovery and the back and forth between the attorneys, uh, the things that they were requesting and the conversations that one of the issues that was raised was that an employee similarly situated was dealt with differently. That another employee who was in a similar situation was, was dealt with differently by the board. And when he was terminated where another employee was not for similar circumstances. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Galbraith, please. Uh, we, 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 do, we, do we have a motion? I think we do. We think we got a motion, do we? Yeah, we have a motion. Okay, do we have comments? It was uh, yeah. Mr. Ture first oh, and no, Mrs. Gasparro second. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Comments. Mr. Brown, you have a comment? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so here we have a case. We are looking to pay a former employee because we decided as a board to not take the superintendent's recommendation on another employee and we dove down different disciplinary actions um, and they coming back and using that disciplinary action on us as part of to achieve a settlement from the board that's what it sounds like so i can find ourselves in the same situation again so me with a good conscience cannot vote on something like this when we have a respective person when we did not have a teacher that was not held accountable for their actions and the board said we did we we did this and the board said we'll do this to mm -hmm. another employee and that's what this is about so we're gonna we're going to impose upon the district and the taxpayers to pay money out to settle a potential lawsuit. To I, I, I think I is, is I think I can make a point of order here on the relevance. This is a different case, has nothing to do with the other case, and uh, I think we should. We have a motion on the floor to vote this up or down, and. What happened to somebody else in the past is not relevant to this particular case. I, I don't see that any relevance. We have a motion on the floor, but we have a, we prior prior to voting, we have the opportunity to voice our concerns, and that's what I did. Well, I'll voice mine that I say it, it's irrelevant, and it's just bringing up old old business that you didn't like, and. Uh, you know, it has no bearing on this. This is a separate and different incident, and it's a different person. So, it's not irrelevant if that is what this person said. So, we just want a clarity. Why? Well, I want a clarity on it. Um, but that's the relevancy. This this particular employee brought up that separate situation as a basis for this. Yeah, but the board voted on that other person, and the board's the 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 uh, the board uh, majority voted not to uh, uh, discipline or remove that other employee. So uh, that's an action that was taken. And it's done. I don't understand the relevance of it here. I'm sure you don't. We can get we can get for if anybody else. Doctor, any other to you. questions, comments? Okay, Ms. Galbraith. Take the roll. Did she call me? Yes. Okay. Mr. Anderson. Present. Mr. Brown. No. Mrs. Gasparro. 
Aye. Mr. Trey? Aye. Dr. Hall? Present. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Thank you, motion passes. Any old business? New business? I have a new business, yes. And uh, uh, did this motion pass or not pass? Passed. It passed, right? Okay. I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. The mic. I have some new business, um, a suggestion actually. Um, these, when we do these lockdowns and the drills in the, in the high school here, um, is there, would we be able to get, a, get the neighboring police departments to participate? Uh, one of the village presidents asked me if uh, they could learn from this and get some training and we could get uh, Mauny and University Park and Park Forest involved with these lockdowns so they all know how to do it in case anything ever, God forbid, happens that, they, that we have to get more police forces involved in an action that uh, locks down the school. They said it would be good training for them. Can we uh, entertain that? Um, I'm going to pass that right over to Dr. Clark because she has set up a meeting with the entire uh, set of uh, police in our area. Uh, could you give them a quick overview of what we're going to do? And uh, certainly. Basically, what we will be discussing um, on the 28th is how we can work together to do what's best for our kids. So in doing so, I'll be able to get an understanding of some of the things that they want from us and um, try to put some things in place to assist. So I can definitely bring that up. And then I will also um, work with Marjorie when she returns to find out how she became aware of the um, lockdowns that they're currently doing um, with the canine units and whatnot and try to see if we can have everything um, more inclusive and, okay. and go that route. Yeah, because they, they asked about that. And then I have a second question on that, just a part two. Um, I understand when they do the sweeps, they go through the hallways and they check the lockers. Um, is that a true statement? They do go through the hallways. I'm going to um, review the information. I was looking for Dr. Um, Harden because they normally send me um, an update after everything, but they do go through the lockers. Um, they sweep the halls and they go by the cars. No students are um, intruded upon in any way. Well, that, that was kind of the point I was getting at. Once the kids understand that they're gonna go through the hallways, what's to prevent them to keep the contraband on their person? I mean, if, what are we checking? Just that it's not in the lockers or, you know, it, you got 1,400, 1,700 kids here and right. we're not checking the kids. So what are, what are we, we're just checking that it's in the lockers? Well, remember, uh, well, in our conversations when we discussed this, one of the things that uh, we discussed is that we did not want um, dogs intruding up on our students. Um, but at the same time, we do want to have some proactive measures. So at this time, we're only looking at the, um, the lockers, the halls, um, and the parking lots. We're trying to make sure that we're respecting their personal spaces as well, because this is something that we've just started to do again. I know it's been done in the past, and I know there's conversation about moving forward. But as a board, I think we will need more discussion before we... Um, take this route and then of course I will take my lead from you. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's important that we remember, um, you know, the dog sniffers, they are very powerful. So if a kid is moving stuff in and out of his locker and by his locker, it still catches and we still talk to those students. And I think it's also important that you realize we cannot legally um, have the dogs check individual kids. Can't be done. It's not legal to do. The reason that we have the legality to be able to actually do these sweeps is that the lockers and the parking lot belongs to us. And anything you bring in the locker or into the parking lot, we can check. So we are legally bound and doing this correctly, but yeah. there are, there's a certain level of privacy that is uh, required and understood by each and every one of those students. 
I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused because I don't know how they do the, the metal detectors in CPS and other districts that have metal detectors that the children must go through. How do, how do they not invade their privacy when they do that? Um, a metal detector is so much different than a dog sniffer. It, it is. They don't have sniffing dogs sitting in front of those um, buildings. They do have metal detectors, and that is legal for them to do. But, and I can get the legal um, documentation on both. Um, and I also want to, again, just clarify that the canines that are coming to our buildings is not because we're um, saying that there is an issue in the schools. It's just some routine proactive measures that they're doing that's going to be part of their normal routines every year now. No, I'm just trying to figure it out. You know, if you can make a kid go through a metal detector, you, it beeps, you, you search them, and there's no problem with that. You can't have a dog walk down the hall with the kid standing in the hallway. I, I don't get that. You know, if you could show me the lie, I'd appreciate it. That would be fine. Thank you. I did send the superintendent an email. I don't know if he saw it. Uh, asking, do we check the generalized areas as well? Do we go into the offices? Do we go into the gyms? Like, are we just going down the hallway? I will get the full workup um, from Dr. Harden in the morning, and I will forward to the board in the FYI. Okay. Thank you. Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn at 918? Moved. So, moved by Mr. Ture. Second. Second by Mrs. Gasparro. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>